As photographers, most of us have had the opportunity to do a portrait now and then, even if it's when you're first starting out and a family member says to you, no, 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 it's okay, you can practice on me. But over time, that turns into not only portraiture, but group portraiture and environmental portraiture and, and event photography. But usually you have not only enough time to get done what you need, but you also have the resources to control the environment. You might be in a studio where you have full control of the lighting. And even if you're outside, you might have the option to take your subject and move them into open shade or use diffusers or off-camera flash. But today we're gonna take group portraiture and environmental portraiture to the next level where you have not only a dark room, but you have almost no control over the lighting and You've got about 5,500 people watching you and a very limited time to do it in. It's the Portrait Pressure Cooker on this episode of Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. This is the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. And with every episode, this episode being the same, you can go check out more of the episodes or blog posts that are associated with those episodes at thisweekinphoto.com. Click the link at the top for behind the shot. You'll get all the info that you need. You can follow me on Twitter at Raz2, R-A-Z-Z-2, on Instagram, Steve Brazel, and on Facebook, it's Steve Brazel Photography. So today, I wanted to hit something a little bit different. Now, this is kind of in my genre, and yet it's not photography portraits, right? Every photographer, no matter how new we are, we've done a portrait. When we're first starting out, there's a family member that says, can you come take portraits? But usually we kind of have control over some of the aspects of that portrait. Today, we're gonna get into basically a group portrait nightmare for many, many people from a pressure point of view and a logistics point of view. Before we do that, let me introduce my guest. It's a Brad Moore, an old friend of mine. Brad, how are you, bud? I'm doing great. How are you, Steve? I'm doing really, really good. It's good to see you. And you are now in Nashville. I am. I love Nashville. It's, it's just a fantastic city. But you're you're originally from Nashville, but you're kind of new to Nashville now, right? Right. I'm actually from Tennessee. I grew up outside of Knoxville, so uh, on kind of on the other side of the state. But uh, yeah, glad to be back home in Tennessee again. So. so being back home, we should mention, many people already know Brad Moore. If you've gone to Photoshop World, you've probably seen Brad Moore. If you're in any way a fan of, like most photographers, of Kelby One, you probably know who Brad Moore is. Brad Moore was Scott Kelby's assistant for how many years? Seven and a half. Seven and a half years of your life helping Scott and learning and absorbing everything, not only from him from a photography point of view, but all the background podcast stuff and video stuff and production stuff having to do with a, a, an event like Photoshop World. And you still actually do some stuff for Scott. What do you do for him now? Yeah, so I still manage uh, on his blog. I, I help out a couple days a week and manage the guest blog Wednesdays, which you were recently part of. Recently part ago. of. There'll be a link for that in the blog post. <laughs> Good. And I uh, also do uh, every week, Kelby One releases a new class. And on Thursdays, they announce that class on Scott's blog. So I handle that post in the, in the guest blog Wednesdays. Well, and also through the through the Kelby thing, I think is probably where this came from. But like when I ran into you at WPPI last time, you were actually leading one of their like pre-conference walkabout workshops, right? Yeah. So I had done that the year before, both at Photo Plus Expo, which is actually happening, depending on when this comes out, already happened or happening soon. Um, and th then at WPPI, it was a natural light portrait photo walk uh where we had, you know, model out and just showing the group of people how to basically how, how best to uh, compose, uh, pose your model or subject, and then also use a diffuser, reflector. And uh, even at the end, we kind of pulled out a little speed light and did some uh, off-camera lighting as well. So, uh, you know, just, just a good all, all around uh, how to use light workshop. See, and that's what I find fascinating about you. And we, we've talked about this over drinks before, but your history before before Scott Kelby, you were what many consider probably rightfully so the definitive person on Nikon lighting systems. Joe McNally, you were his assistant for a number of years. Correct. I was there for just over two years right out of college, though, which which so. actually makes me wonder. 
you do appreciate the education that you've gotten from those two jobs, right? You have no idea how much I appreciate everything that I learned from Joe and Scott and Joe's studio manager, Lynn, and other assistants that we worked with. Uh, actually, one of our one of the first shoots that uh, I did with Joe was uh, we had Zach Arias as an assistant. <laughs> I would love to get <laughs> for, Zach Arias for, on this show. Zach Arias yeah. is some of my favorite quotes of all time, actually. He's, he's a pretty fantastic guy. I, I love him a lot. He... Uh, Taught me that bringing coffee to set is never a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, well, bring a coffee anywhere. For me, a Diet Coke. Especially bring, in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Bringing the right drink somewhere is always a good thing. Well, so, Diet Coke or, or a good bourbon for you. Or a good bourbon for me. Right. <laughs> Actually, I've got an Irish whiskey we got to talk oh, about. Oh, all right. Yeah. Right. Bushmill 60. After, but anyway, the show, after the show. I digress. <laughs> um, so you with this education that you've got from assisting these two guys, both in the business end, which, which I want to stress, both on the business side and on the photography side, you now have the skill set of one of the elite photographers that is out there. Mm -hmm. And your client list actually reflects that. You've worked for Red Bull, Walmart, FedEx, Nikon. I mean, you've got pedigree underneath you now. You've got a resume underneath you that now props you up on your own. And you're doing your own, as we talked about, education stuff. Yeah, no, so, no pressure or anything. No pressure or anything, <laughs> right. So I guess the real question is, with all of this background, what do you call yourself photography wise? Are, are you a portrait photographer or, are, or a music photographer? What are you? <laughs> what um, are you? That's a good line. Well, see, that, that that's a good question, because I'm honestly, even even though I've been in and around the, the industry and the business for over a decade at this point, I'm still figuring that out because, uh, you know, one of the privileges of working with uh, it mainly started when I was working with Scott, having a job where, you know, I had a predictable paycheck and everything. I did, I wasn't really living the freelance lifestyle like I am now, but that also afforded me the time and opportunity to get into photographing concerts, which I would get paid for every once in a while, but it wasn't a regular uh, income right. by any means, but it allowed me the opportunity to go and be able to start shooting shows and build my portfolio and hone my craft in that area. Like I said, it doesn't pay that well that frequently. So now that I'm on my own freelance, I actually don't do that much music photography anymore. I haven't been doing that much. When I do do it, I'm generally doing it for pay. So if I'm not doing that, I've got to focus on whatever else I can do to, you know, stay alive and pay bills. So, so it's, it's a little of everything then. It's, it, it it's is a little portraiture, of everything now. it's commercial work, it's music yeah. photography, and you do videography too. Yeah, I was going to say, I've been doing video work. I'm actually in the middle of an edit for uh, the YMCA right now. There's uh, one that does, uh, they, they work with breast cancer uh, patients and survival survivors. And so they do a fundraiser each year. And I shot some interviews with some of the uh, ladies that are involved with that, their family members and friends, and I'm editing that together for their event next week. Um, you know, you just you just actually kind of kicked in a thought to me. Yeah. Somebody needs to do a a podcast like this related to video, right? Take yeah. video clips and kind of dissect what the director or maker of it did. I think that would be a good thing. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting because I've looked at your work extensively because I've known you a couple of years at this point, but uh, you have in the way that you shoot your, your composition and your style to me has a video feel to it, right? Okay. You have, I, I see, I, I don't even know how to word this. Um, I see motion and life in your shots that, that you don't see in a lot of still photography. For example, the shot that we're going to talk about today, right? This is a group portrait. So as I bring this up, tell us a little bit about who this is, what you were doing there, that type of a thing. Sure. So uh, the shot we're talking about today, these these are my buddies in Under Oath. Uh, and they're, they're a band that's mostly based out of Tampa. I think Aaron, the guy in the middle, uh, I can't remember if he still lives in Salt Lake or if he moved back to Florida, but I know that uh, he, he was originally from Florida and whatever, but Anyway, so uh, I got to, got to be friends with these guys over the past few years. Um, three of the guys, actually, I went to church with in Tampa, so that was kind of how I got to know them. And uh, I only really knew one of them, Tim, the guy on the far left. I knew him uh, the most whenever 
they originally, back in, I think, 2013, decided to call it quits. So they had been a band that had been around for quite a while in the, the heavy music scene, and they just got to a point where half of them were married and were having, you know, starting families and had kids. And just the touring lifestyle is not conducive to being a, a great husband and father. So they were kind of at a cross cro- crossroads and they decided to do kind of one farewell tour as a band. And um, I was able to get access to their last show that they played in uh, St. Pete and had all had all access to that and had a good time shooting that show. But I didn't really know the other guys all that well. I knew Tim and uh, James as well. And uh, so this is in so, St. Petersburg. No, this is actually in Orlando. So that was 2013. That they actually broke up. They they quit touring, quit playing, and then in 20 I think 16 uh, they decide they just they were, they remained friends, but they just weren't touring anymore. But they through group text kind of started joking about it, getting back together and touring and uh, decided to do that. So their two biggest albums. Uh, only chasing safety and uh, define the great line. It was their like 10 and 12 year anniversary for those two albums. Their two most popular albums. And so they decided to get back together and go on tour again and play those two albums from beginning to end back to back with just a short break in between the two albums. So uh, as I found out that they were doing that, I was able to, uh, now that I knew all of them a little better, I was able to start uh, shooting them whenever they started rehearsing for the tour, just even even getting together in their uh, storage space and playing. And then uh, dude, they did some tech rehearsals and they did a secret show and then they kicked off the tour in St. Pete, the same venue where they played their last show ever uh, before this. <laughs> and uh, then this shot is actually in Orlando at the end of that reunion tour, the, at least the first leg of it. Anyway, they, they toured the U S and, uh, they've been touring again this year with some other bands and playing some different shows, but this was, this specific show was the last show of their original reunion tour. So I've actually photographed this band, Mm -hmm. I think two times, maybe three times, but at least two at self-help with a day to remember. Yeah. And, I will say amazing live, right? From a photographic point of view, these guys are amazing live. Put on a great show. They're very boring. Lots of hair they flinging and move. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> they don't stand or sit at a microphone and not move. I mean, these yeah. guys are active, right? Yeah. So let's get into the group portrait session sure. of this. So first thing I'm always curious about is okay, they perform their show. Mm-hmm. How you know, most bands when they're done with a the show, they leave the stage. Right. How was it set up or arranged that let's all pose with our back to the audience so that Brad can come out and take a shot? Who who came up with that? Me. <laughs> this was a shot that I wanted and I was able, like, because I knew them well enough, I was able to, to say, guys, I know at the end of the show, you're going to be exhausted. You're going to be excited. You're going to be all sorts of emotions, but... I think that if you guys were able to go out to the front of the stage, turn around and face me and just let me get a shot of you guys with the entire crowd behind you, that's something that you're going to love to have and be able to remember, you know, later on. So, uh, whenever, like I, you know, I'd seen the show a few times on this tour already. And so I knew when they were you know, getting ready to be done. And so as they, played their last song as they were finishing it. I basically ran out into the middle of the stage. They knew I was going to do it. So I ran out to the middle of the stage and made sure they didn't forget. <laughs> Go out there, guys. So, so where, where are you in this? Are you on the drum riser in front of the I'm drum riser? I'm standing right in front of the drum, drum riser. Uh, maybe, so maybe, give maybe a me an bit. idea on distance to them. Honestly, so this, I believe, let me double check my settings. Uh, yeah, this was shot with the Canon 11 to 24 meter, millimeter lens. And this was at 11 millimeters. I honestly don't remember how much I cropped in if I if I cropped in, but I wanted to make sure that I was able to get as much of the crowd and the venue in the shot as possible. So I don't know that I would have cropped very much. Um, you shot a group portrait at 11 millimeters. If you want to, if you want to see all the crowd behind them and show just how many people are there, and this is this okay. is Hard Rock Live in Orlando. The capacity I think was 5,500 somewhere on there. So. You know, uh, 
all and and this was one of the shows that sold out pretty quickly because you know it's close to their hometowns and uh it's the last show that they knew they were going to be playing for a while so yeah okay so a couple a couple of things hit my head here right Number one is most people will tell you, you know, don't shoot people at 11 millimeters. Now, we concert photographers use yeah. wide angle all I was the time. Say, I would agree with that. But that's live. Time. Continue. <laughs> right. But did you did you profile correct this in post? Or is that <sighs> lens just that rectilinear? I'm not completely sure. I know that like that lens is fairly rectilinear. Because they don't look like balloons. And at 11 millimeters in my head, I picture fisheye, right? Right. Well, here's the thing with with that lens, with any sort of wide angle lens, the closer you are to the subject, the more distortion you're going to have. Now, even with a wide angle lens, if you if you keep somebody right in the middle, they're not going to distort as much as as on the edges. Right now. had Yeah, absolutely. Had they been on the edges, then distortion city. Absolutely. Um, What's the rest of your exposure on this shot? Let's see. Uh, I'm at ISO four thousand. The that lens, the the maximum aperture is uh, f four, so I was at f four, and then the shutter is one two fiftieth of a second, and I had exposure compensation at plus one third. Okay, so therein lies another question. You said exposure compensation, mm-hmm. which means you're not in manual. Uh, so my camera settings, whenever I'm shooting concerts, I'm in aperture priority mode, and I use auto ISO. I know many concert shooters, including our good friend Alan Hess, that swears by manual mode. In for for my own personal preference and experience, auto ISO helps me focus on shooting and not pushing buttons and spinning dials. Do you put a limit on on so your this, ISO? This was shot with upper the, lower. Yeah, so this was shot with the Canon One DX. So that camera can handle quite a bit of ISO. Um, basically the minimum setting ISO 100 and then the maximum, I usually stick it at whatever the native ISO is, whatever the maximum native ISO is, because you get into like the high one, high two stuff. And I don't want to go there. Um, I want to say on this, I could be very wrong, but I want to say on the one DX, it's like 25,600 maybe. Really? I want to say, um, so then, so then you're shooting a concert and this thing's an automatic. Mm Mm-hmm. And obviously with auto ISO and aperture priority, you've set it to F4 wide open. Mm-hmm. Um, it is at that point trying to uh, trying to center expose. In fact, that bit me recently where I was shooting a show in in uh, in AV mode. And then suddenly it was like, if you're going to shoot, you know, these two famous people that happen to be under an easy up with walls on it in shade you got to do it now i ran and took the shot and as i clicked the shutter Mm -hmm. i felt this lag and it was one thirteenth of a second because aperture priority went oh okay i'll expose that for you so in this instance uh i don't know that i had that issue but what i i don't know i had a thought where did it go uh oh metering i always use spot metering so see, but on the one DX, you get spot metering. Exactly. No the 5D, other Canon. You don't get the, fi- the spot well, metering. I mean, you get spot metering, but your, spot, true spot, metering. your spot metering follows your focus exactly. point. Even on a 5D4, and people argue this with me, and I, I try and explain to them, no, 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 it's a fact. Spot metering on a 5D4 is always the center spot, regardless of where you move your focus yeah. point. Yeah. So, and I, now I've shot both Nikon and Canon and love both. They both have their advantages, disadvantages, whatever. The disadvantage for Canon is unless you've got that top of the line body, you don't really get true spot metering. And I hate that because I do use a 5D as a second body sometimes. And it, it's frustrating as all get out because and I, and I found that out the hard way. I didn't realize that spot metering wasn't true spot metering on a 5D and kept getting way overexposed shots from a show that I that I had photographed. And I was just like, what the heck is going on with this? And I had to switch back to, you know, evaluative metering to make sure that my shots weren't crazy because like at least then it's reading the scene and I can be pretty consistent. Yeah. With and that's the, by the uh, way what I do. I, I shoot I shoot evaluative, which is the entire yeah. scene. In my case, most of it's black and then there's a spotlight, so it's never centered. Yeah. I just know 
based on how well the singer is lit, whether or not I want to do, you know, a stop or the other night it was actually two stops under yeah. um, versus a stop over uh, on watching my meter. Yeah. So you're shooting this mm-hmm. shot, you run out there, right? Um, stage lighting is designed to, to light them from the front. Right. So when they run out there and turn their backs to the crowd, is that why you're at 250th at 4,000 ISO where their face is actually dark? Or did you talk to the lighting guy and go, no, dude, we, we, when you see me, crank some stage lights. Yeah, we knew this was going to happen. I had talked to the lighting guy already. And honestly, like they, they knew this was going to happen. And so the, he also put light on the crowd. He made sure the guys were lit. Like you've got the backlight coming in for, on them as well. But like, yeah, we we... We planned this out as best as I could. Like I, I was there long before the show started. I was, uh, you know, talked to the lighting director and made sure that like we had the lighting we needed for it. And did and did this, you see yeah. it in advance or get to go up on stage, pull the camera out, and 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 check it? Mm, this was a year and a half ago. I don't really remember to be honest. Okay, so let me ask you a, a question. Going back to what you said mm-hmm. about Alan Hess, right? Yeah. Uh, Alan Hess wrote the book on this type of photography, literally yep. wrote the book on this type of photography, right? Yep. And like like me, he does uh, uh, manual mode. Mm-hmm. And there's times I've tried AV. I use AV, for example, at a, at a warp tour or something or, or just uh, recently a Cal Jam with the Foo Fighters all day yeah. long because the lighting is so dynamic, right? So as... As you're shooting with this in automatic mode, do you ever say to yourself, uh, you know, I wonder what I could do in manual? Um, the only time I ever really go manual mode is if I'm shooting something outside in the in the daytime and the sun's pretty consistent. Or or if I if it's a show that the lighting just doesn't ever really change. Like if I know that the stage lighting is static and isn't adjusting throughout the show then I'll go manual mode, but it's maybe 5% of the time. If that, that I ever go. Interesting. Do you limit your shutter? So, so you set 100 to whatever native ISO is, which is an insane number on that body, Mm -hmm. you know, on a five D you might want to stay 6,400 on a five D four. Um, but what do you do when, when you want a Canon, you turn on auto ISO for those that don't shoot Canon or, or don't use the higher end bodies. Uh, when you have a higher end body on a Canon, you can also limit if I'm in auto ISO, limit my shutter speed to this range. What what range do you set that at? For an act like Under Oath where they're moving around a lot, I usually try to do it at at least 250th of a second. Um, yeah, one 250th of a second. And then if it's a slower act that's just, you know, like James Taylor or something, then one 125th is fine. Uh, but usually, ideally, even with a with a act that's moving around and has a lot of action, I would like to go higher than that. But the lighting is going to dictate that if it's not very bright lighting, then I'm not going to try to go higher uh, because then you're just maxing out your ISO See, the entire time. And and I find out lately that uh, I'm just, maybe it's not, I'm not as stable as I used to be. I used to be able to shoot almost anything at one two fiftieth, but man, do I feel a lot more comfortable at 400th or 500th of a second now with the type sure. of metal and, and hair flips and sweat yeah. flying that, that, that I tend to shoot. So now, depending on some of the cameras, you might not even be able to go above one two hundred fifty of a second on the auto ISO. Now, I don't know if that's just because I, I don't know if I've up, not updated to the latest firmware or not, but I know that that was like one of the top settings last time I checked mine. So when you, when you go out for a shot like this, mm-hmm. and how long did you have? I mean, obviously they're not going to stand there forever, right? You can't you can't shoot this shot and go, okay, hold on. And chimp. Uh, oh, you know what? Hold on. Let me uh, adjust. Okay, let's do it again. Right. I mean, how now, long did you have? I think that I may have actually done that to some extent because I like this. I didn't just go out, take one shot and say, okay, thanks. Like I went out like at, like I ran out before they were out at the end of the stage. So I went ahead and like did a quick test shot. And if I had to make any adjustment, then I did. So like, you know, I definitely had a second to like make any adjustments that I needed to make. Uh, cause I did like, I didn't want to miss this shot. So like, I didn't take any more time than I absolutely had to, but it wasn't just like go out one shot and done. It was like, go out to take a shot, check it. If I had to make an adjustment, I would make it. But then like, which one, for you is just exposure compensation. Basically. Right? Yeah. Because I'm not having to do any math in my head because I'm using auto settings. 
because I trust the right. camera Smart. for the most part. Smart in that sense, yeah. So when they ran out there, though, you're at F4. Now, granted, you're at F4 at 11 millimeters, so yeah. pretty much everything from you to Florida is in focus. Exactly. But, uh, even then, you don't want to miss it, right? Right. So did they just run out there and line up on their own, or did you try and explain to them, I want everybody on the same plane? Nope. They just ran out there and wrapped arms around each other and did that. Um, I think... I think there might have been another frame that I actually like the lighting a little better on, but um, as our other friend Jim Azell would say, gesture trumps everything. So this was just was the shot that had the best gesture. You know, you got Speed's got his tongue out, Chris has his arms up in the air, you know, head back screaming. Tim's got his, you know, hands up. So yeah, that. So out, what you're saying is out of the sequence that you shot. Yeah, this was this one had the best gestures. Okay, interesting. So you went you like most people you went for the moment exactly yeah now i i would not i i didn't do this on this shot and i can only think of really one other shot that i'm that i've done it on it's not even in my portfolio or anything but i remember there was one show that i shot and there were two frames that were pretty much like right next to each other and the lights were amazing in one but the performer wasn't doing anything and then the very next shot, the lights were not where I wanted them, but he was doing something great. So I combined the two shots, a little, little Photoshop action. But uh, okay, I, like I said, I wouldn't do that if I were shooting for like a, a journalistic out, outfit or anything, but for my own use, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but, but it is interesting to know that you shot a sequence and of the sequence, why you kind of pick what you did. But, but there's a whole nother part to this shot we're not talking about and that's all the people that are in it right yeah now so I, when you're out I did there strategically and you, call them out one by one and say okay i want you to do this i want you to do, no i'm joking i didn't yeah you ran through the audience <laughs> ahead of time and gave them all instructions yeah totally <laughs> so when you're shooting them they're all screaming i mean you've got yeah i was thinking it was like 2000 you're, you're talking like 5500 fans yeah screaming you've got limited time you got to figure it out are you aware of that pressure or, or if you were to give a tip to somebody that suddenly was in that last minute pressure scenario, how do you not get freaked out? Honestly, like the crowd knows what's up They're They're there. They've just had the time of their lives. Now, again, this is this is a little different than, you know, just some show in, you know, Sheboygan in the middle of the tour. Like this is like the people that are here have been waiting to see their favorite band for years and thought that they might not ever go on, out on tour again. And here they are. So like, they're stoked, you know, this, it's not just like, Oh yeah, I've seen them. I saw them, you know, last year, like this is, they've waited minimum three years. And if they didn't get to see them on that tour, then maybe six years or something. So like, they're they're there because they're fans and they're not they're not just like oh well you know somebody my friend wants to go see the show i'll tag along you right. know like they're they're there because they're in love with this band so you pull this thing into the computer what is it that you use in post what software do you use so i start off in photo mechanic to go through and kind of call my selects and then i bring the selects into lightroom Okay. And Photoshop, if needed for just portfolio stuff, I mean, how percentage wise, like 90% in Lightroom, like everybody else? 90, 95% Lightroom, yeah. Very, okay. very rarely am I taking anything into Photoshop these days because uh, Lightroom can just do so much. But if there's ever any like heavy lifting, like there is, I won't give, I won't give it all away, but there is one shot in my portfolio currently that I spent a fair amount of time uh, with in Light, or in, sorry, in Photoshop. Because it's it is a very symmetrical shot, and there was one thing on one side of the frame that bugged the crap out of me, so I I cloned it out. But uh, I, I won't I won't give away the farm on that one. <laughs> but this one this one yeah don't there's, don't there's, ruin the surprise. Yeah, Let people try and figure out what it is on this one. There's no uh, we'll there's give, no crazy we'll, Photoshop on this one. And we'll give Brad's website here at the, in just a second <laughs> at the end. But uh as i'm looking at this shot i and we're talking about post first of all concert pictures can be noisy especially in shadows mm -hmm. and especially where there's fog people wonder people ask me all the time how do you get it to where you can see the light beams and that's done because they release either smoke or fog machines yeah. to show the beam you can definitely enhance the problem, that though you, right and and you can enhance that and most people do but it also accentuates noise so what do you use for noise reduction the luminance slider the noise reduction luminance slider. I okay. So whatever's built yeah, into. Yeah, I, I don't go 
nine times out of 10, there's no extra third party plugins or software that I use. If I do use something, uh, what is it? Uh, the Mac fun stuff I'm a fan of. They, they have really good stuff that I've, I've used for sure. Um, especially for the black, black and white uh, work. If I, if I'm doing behind the scenes, uh, more documentary style stuff. I like to convert that to black and white and Mac fun has a really nice, uh, uh, plugin for that. Yeah. Like yeah. tonality and, but their noise reduction stuff yeah. I have too, which is really, really good. But for so, the most part, especially with the one DX, like the one DX handles high ISO pretty well. And it's only at 4,000, which sounds kind of crazy if you're used to shooting film, but, uh, you know, only at 4,000 for the one DX isn't that bad, but even then I'll bump up the, noise reduction slider maybe to 10 or something i don't ever go above like 20 to 25 no matter what it is yeah. that's about me too i'm usually around 15 yeah. and maybe if i need to 20 to 25 but if i do then i really tweak the other sliders yeah. uh to kind of compensate on what's being sharpened and how i'm i'm sharpening yeah. it so i have i have one last area that i want to talk about real quick before we close and that is your mm -hmm. composition. I, I mentioned that that I see kind of a film eye, an emotion eye in your shots. And and I'm curious if some of this was was uh, intentional on your part. First of all, the way that you crop this thing at the 11 millimeters. I'm sure you cropped some because 11 is really wide, but you chose to leave all of that headroom with the truss in there, which to me gets us back to what we started talking about, right? This is an environmental portrait. So many photographers would shoot this tight around them, but you not only got the room and the fans, but you got the ceiling mm -hmm. lights. I find that that really enforces uh, the portrait uh, aspect of this, the environmental portrait aspect of this. But in with that, their head positions. Had you been lower, their heads would be in the second bal in that balcony area and the edge of the balcony would cut their heads off but their heads are below that not being bisected by that balcony line was that intentional um now that you mention that i would say that it is like i'm not sitting here I, again i if you'd asked me the next day i put, probably could have told you exactly what was going through my mind at the time that i shot this but if i had to guess i went out put the camera to my eye and then like moved up and down to, to where, you know, their, their heads were, I wanted them. So I would say, yes, that's intentional. Um, yeah. See, and that takes us to that Zach Arias. I said that Zach Arias has a bunch of quotes. My, one of my favorite quotes in photography is, and I'm sure somebody else said it before him, maybe in a different way, but the way he just abbreviated head in a clean yeah. spot. Right. And, and that, that never leaves my mind. It's on his one light video uh, that I own both of. Um, head in a clean spot, head in a clean spot. I just, it, it radiates yeah. through me. I love the composition of this. I love the, the really clean, realistic, three-dimensional colors that you get. Um, and I just really, the whole shot, the way it's composed and assembled, really well Thank done, you. man. I appreciate that. So if, if people want to learn more about Brad Moore, where mm -hmm. can they go? Be More Visuals is my handle for everything. That's my first initial and last name, B-M-O-O-R-E, visuals. So that's .com, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Vimeo. It's all there. So everything somebody needs, Be More Visuals. Yep. I love, uh, by the way, I use that as an example to people of great names. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, be more visuals. I dig that. Uh, so thank you very much for, you know, I've been wanting to have you on for a long time and we've bounced back and forth sure. and I really appreciate you taking the time. Out Absolutely. Of your day, especially for me. since we messed up, I messed up the time zones <laughs> and gave you the wrong time. So my apologies. No, 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 you're good. So once again, thank you to my guest, Brad Moore, for joining me on Behind the Shot today. Really appreciate it. Check out more of his stuff, bemorevisuals.com and be more visuals everywhere. And remember, it's M-O-O-R-E for the more part of Be More Visuals. Uh, check him out, ton of great work out there. And if you're down in the Nashville area, find him, say hi if you see him shooting a show or see him shooting something around town. Uh, my name is Steve Brazel, the host of Behind the Shot, where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. Along with this episode, there'll be an associated blog post at uh, thisweekinphoto.com. Click the link at the top for Behind the Shot. Find the one with Brad. You'll see a bunch more of his work. I've got links up there, everything that you're pretty much going to need. And of course, make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app 
or iTunes or whatever you choose to consume your podcasts so that you always get the newest episodes delivered right to you. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next time. Hey there, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. Thanks for checking out the TWIP Network on YouTube. If you'd like to keep up to date with the shows we're putting out, be sure to click subscribe. And while you're at it, give us a thumbs up. You can also subscribe on thisweekinphoto.com where you'll find lots of other great photography shows. Thanks for watching the TWIP Network on YouTube.